Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 524, featuring an interview with my good friend Matt Bradley Shergi. Bradley Shergi has just released a new book. It's called Star Trek Video Games, An Unofficial Guide to the Final Frontier. And if you like Star Trek, which I assume you do if you're watching this channel, and if you like video games, which I assume you do if you're watching this channel, uh, you're really going to like this book. You'll, you want to hear uh, Matt and I chat about it. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Matt Bradley Shergi. So, Matt Bradley Shergi, Mr. Star Trek Video Games. Yes, hey. How are you going? doing? <laughs> Good. We should mention... Living you living long and prospering over there? Something like that. We should mention up front that I'm the assistant producer on Matt Chat. So, well, people know that, I hope. I think so. I don't, but then I was talking in the... Um, what is it in the discord and some people were starting like oh i had no idea there was a producer and i'm like yep ah now they've here he is yes in the flesh although maybe i think i was on here just, maybe they thought you were fictional <laughs> maybe a pen name although yeah <laughs> he's real folks he's real yeah star trek star trek That's yeah i mean really good book yeah oh oh thank you i'm, I'm glad you liked it i think we had talked no, about i don't this know if you bit. want to talk about the book do you not <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, that's why I'm here. But yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You know, I'm glad you liked it. I think Star Trek is tricky, right? Because it's it's one of those things where the fandom is just so big. And mm -hmm. going into this project, when I pitched it to the publisher, I said I wasn't going to cover every Star Trek game, and I didn't. So, but I tried to choose like a variety of genres and uh, platforms and. Um, you know, of course, one of the more recent stuff on there as well. So in a way, it was kind of a, a history of computer games kind of done through the lens of Star Trek, I think, what I was um, trying to do. And at the same time, not make it super um, technical, uh, except for the interview part of it. So I feel like I had a couple of thoughts on it. Let me see if I can share it. You can take a look at this. So one thing, I, the more I thought about this concept of Star Trek video games and how there's so many, and they're on so many different platforms, you know, everything from the Game Boy, you even have Vectrex <laughs> game. Yes, and, yes. And there's lots of different platforms, approaches, and genres. You know, so really, it's a. I think you're right. It's a good lens. But you can use these. Uh, you can use this to talk about all the different ways you might take this show, these movies, these concepts, try to adapt them for all these different game playing devices. <laughs> you know, really in the process, you learn a lot about the history of the the video games industry. You know, as well as the Star Trek. Reading this, well, well, great, and yeah, I think with it's tricky too because doing Star Trek as a video game, I think, is kind of absurd because Star Trek is usually <laughs> yeah. about people talking, right? And they 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 go to a planet and there's some ethical conundrum and they make a choice, and it's kind of the kind of show where you can watch it for the explosions, but ideally you should watch it and kind of think about it afterwards. So, and then to have that in a video game, I mean, especially early on where it's the Atari or uh, you know the the mainframes at MIT or whatever, and you just have asterixes you know it looks like uh rogue mm. or um the uh, uh atari where it's like one button on a joystick and how do you make that star trek like you know it's really um that's part of what i found interesting about it and i think uh i told a friend this the other day i think the variety of of Star Trek games is greater than the Star Wars games but maybe the Star Wars games are more consistently better overall Hmm. I don't know. Uh, but we were, you'd asked me uh, about the interviews in the book. Yep. Which I thought were the most interesting. And that, that was when you were talking about the adapting the Star Trek to video games and sort of the difficulties of that. <laughs> There's an interview you have in here with Michael Stackpole. We will probably know that name. Did a lot, I think he did some work on uh, some Interplay stuff before. He did. He was a writer on Wasteland. Wasteland. He Not worked that. on the new on the Wasteland, Wasteland Two or whatever the new one is. Um, We've so. done a bunch of other games too. But anyway, yeah, he's in this interview. I really liked the. I liked all the interviews, but the one with him, I thought, really gets into some interesting territory. 
like he was saying that uh he's talking about wasteland which i believe that came out in like the early 80s or mid 80s That sounds about right, yeah. around there but he was you'd ask him about judgment rights and how you could skip the battle sequences Yes. <laughs> and so he was commenting on that but he says uh, part of this He says, back in the days of Wasteland, graphics and audio sucked. We needed a lot of story to keep the games engaging and to hold people there. When graphics started getting better and sounds, sound cards improved, the emphasis and resources got redirected towards graphic and sound. Therefore, the job of myself and the other writers became greatly diminished from those earlier games. Quite frankly, I found it very frustrating. You know, I've never seen that articulated that way. Right. And I That's wonder, if, <laughs> yeah, I wonder if he was getting that because not that Wasteland's a text adventure exactly, but you do have a lot more freedom as far as what you can do. It's more of a non-linear gameplay experience where compared to, you know, Star Trek Judgment Rights or 25th Anniversary, which are, you know, probably some of my favorite games I discuss in the book, these kind of, you know, graphic adventure games, or it's more like uh, Space Quest or something like that. Um, as you're going around in, in the game, it's pretty, although there's choices of what you can say, it's pretty much like a right answer or a wrong answer and a silly answer. And it's not like, you know, like a wasteland or um, fallout or something where you're just there in the world uh, exploring and you can do what you want and talk to people and have more branching, uh, branching paths. But yeah, I agree. I thought when uh, that was one of my favorites to to do. I, I grew up um, loving Stackpole's, oh, like his, especially the Rogue Squadron kind of X-wing novels, yeah, and, that's... And, and and so forth. So, um, but that that he worked on the Star Trek stuff is is cool too. And of course, it when he ro wrote uh, dialogue for the game, they never knew they were going to do a CD version with voices. And to hear like the actors, you know, do the voices eventually for the CD-ROM version. I mean, that had to be cool. Because that was the last thing all the original Star Trek guys worked on was a uh, 25th anniversary and judgment rights yeah. doing the voice. I mean, that's amazing. If you really are a completionist with Star Trek, you have to play this because you're yeah. not. This is an important part of the of the phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, that's a I, fun. I think so. Even in uh, William Shatner's most recent memoir, he talks about judgment rights and how much he remembers liking the writing on that game. So, yeah, I think you said that was your favorite, right? Judgment Rights. One of them, yeah. I mean, 25th anniversary is good, but Judgment Rights, it on each, uh, I don't know if you want to say level, I guess each each mission, because it's very mission based, uh, you get to go and do uh, missions with different members of the crew. It's not always just Spock and McCoy like it is in the first one. And, uh, and that variety uh, makes it fun. Page 36. I didn't know there were so many. <laughs> There's so many Star Trek games. Wow. Yeah, Judgment. Here we go, folks. If you want to see. So this was 1994. That's right. Yeah, it had a, a diskette version, and this was the CD-ROM version with the voices. Yeah, this is a good point, too. A lot of these, a lot of times the first game isn't as good mechanics wise because they still need to you're still working on some of the details right and then you get a better game in the, the fall yeah, and and one thing that's strange about this is that the diskette version uh you could buy an expansion pack for it that added i think um higher quality music files and some cg cutscenes, and, that, and that's one of the cg cutscenes right there um but then to get the full voice, you had to get the CD-ROM version. So to get to pay for an expansion pack just for better sound effects struck me as kind of strange. But I guess it's sort of like a... Wait, so what is this? You had to buy an... Exp Wait. Yeah, yeah. So the original version of Star Trek Judgment Rights was diskette. It didn't have the voices the first time around. Right. And, and if you wanted better sound effects and brief CG cinematics, which is like what you see in that picture there, the Enterprise upside down, it looks um, you know kind of bad by today's standards you had to buy an expansion pack for the game. And um, the voices, of course, they weren't able to do on diskette. They had to do that on CD-ROM uh, um, a few years later.
but to buy an expansion pack to get a few extra cutscenes and you know more accurate laser effects to me is just um so we're ridiculous. Not talking about an expansion that adds the sound. I mean the voice acting. No, 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 right. This yeah. was just to get <laughs> <laughs> just if you wanted on the on the original text or version where it's no voices, if you wanted to have you know fancy scenes of the enterprise exploding or whatever happens, right? You had to shell out extra money, which strikes to me as how pretty. Much, how much did it cost? Do you know? I think it was twenty or thirty dollars. Too much. I mean, it's not like a mission pack, right? Where it's extra levels or an extra planet to go to. Um, well, that makes today's like DLC look good by comparison. <laughs> I, it, yeah, yeah. I guess you can make a comparison of that. It's just so it, that just struck me as very absurd. I ran across an advertisement for that in that uh, computer gaming world archive. Yeah, I think you had a lot of fun writing this, Matt. I noticed a lot of little Trekkie, uh, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, like, delusions, references. Yeah, references, kind of jokes. I, some of those I took out because I thought it was getting a bit too jokey, and then sometimes the uh, the publisher wouldn't understand the references. Um, and that cracked me up, was it? That goes okay. together like Dr. McCoy and a mint julep. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. There's a that ep, that shore leave episode of the original series where um, oh man, uh, McCoy talks about mint juleps. So that was is that the one with the Easter bunny? Yes, yes, with the Easter bunny, which is fitting because it's uh, going to be Easter weekend as of when we record this. So and there's a lot of trivia games. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's one that was interesting. So like you have. Early on, there's uh, in the book, another I mean, good interview, by the way, it was with the one you had with Scott Miller. That's it, yeah. Scott Miller, who's a, a founder of Apogee, the very first thing they released was like a knockoff Star Trek trivia game that they didn't have the rights to. And I think um, allegedly Paramount told them to knock it off, but it, at any rate, they stopped selling it at some point. And using the shareware model, you could do up to, they had up to 10 volumes of that. 10 volumes? Yes, and I, I asked him about that in the interview, and he says, well, I wanted it to appear more impressive than it was, because, I mean, he just programmed this all by himself, right? It, it has PC speaker sound effects. You can see right there it says volume X. I wonder how much money he made with this. That's a good question. Um, I didn't. I thought about asking it, but like people don't like answering those kind of questions, and legally, a lot of times they can't. Oh, but that, sure they can. <laughs> but that... Um, he probably doesn't want to hear from Paramount trying to collect on some. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I mean, but it's it was a smart move, I think, because it was a simple game he could do by himself. And uh, people with computers like Star Trek, and that was a given, especially at that time, right? Not oh, that many yeah, people. I can see this being a hit, you know? Yeah. I, so, sure, if I'd have had this, I'd have played the heck out of it with my dad, I'm sure. Right, right. Yeah, you can play with. Uh, different people on the teams if you want and then if you it gives you a ranking i got academy dropout i wasn't very good at the trivia but yeah. it's uh i guess you see you could have picked screenshots well you did you got it right there <laughs> you <yeah>. dropped out <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was so funny i had to do it and uh the screenshots is tricky i decided on three screenshots per game i didn't want to do too much and i always included a title screen because i felt that was important because it's kind of the first impression you get from a game other than looking at the box. Yeah. And um, people don't understand how hard it can be to get some of these old games to work. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Especially the one I found the hardest is a DS nine game called dominion war. Um, and it's a RTS with no base building. That was the big gimmick with it. It's terrible. You just like have units and just attack each other, which isn't very um, exciting. And to get it to run, I think it might have been Windows 98 or something originally. It could only run in 800 by 600 resolution. And, uh, and somehow I got it running with some um, wraparound utilities. But th those, uh, some of those Windows games are harder to get working than the old DOS games. Yeah. Well, DOS games, you've got DOS box, which can solve pretty yeah. much the problem if oh. you just might take a while to figured out but yeah i'm the same way with these early windows ones sometimes i can get them running but it won't let me take a screenshot you know i've had that problem just keep keep getting a, a black screen yeah sometimes i had to use a, a plug-in to get screenshots or 
you know, doing the screenshots took longer than playing the game itself to get an idea of what the game was. But you can get an idea of what it looks like. I mean, at the time, these graphics weren't great. The interface is uh, overly complicated. It looks neat, though. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. But like this screen right here is just gave me nightmares. Like you're, you're selecting people to put on your ships and then you launch your fleet. But it's not at all obvious how to do that. It's like one of the most over-designed interfaces I've seen for that sort of thing. Um, but it's, you know, you could play as either the, uh, what I think the, the good guys or the Cardassians. There's different campaigns. I think it does multiplayer, um, although you can't really test that out nowadays. But yeah, I mean, stuff, but that there's not that many of these Star Trek games available for people to buy legally. If you go on uh, GOG.com and look up Star Trek, I think there's maybe uh, nine or ten games. And my guess is part of the reason for that is you have um like with star wars for instance you have LucasArts, and most of those are first party titles but they're all through the same publisher but star trek is a zillion different publishers and i'm sure the rights are just uh, a mess for that um not to mention the trouble in getting that stuff running and you know whatever they have uh, demand for it looks like them here on they get say they got fourteen games, but just looking at these, some of them are not Star Trek games. Yeah, so it's not if you click if show this. Yeah. So Elite Force, Starfleet Command Three, Bridge Commander. Yeah. A lot of the ones you talk about in your book. Right. Well, I that was on purpose. I think you know these, well, these are games people can get, and I want people to buy these games if they sound interesting and hopefully the book will inspire um, GOG or someone else to release more of these games because there's a lot out there that's um, you know just isn't available and if you can get it it's not easy to run and I, I GOG I'm, I'm a big uh, fan of in that you can buy these old games legitimately and, and play them fairly easily some of them still need a bit of tweaking but so if you had never played one which would you recommend I would say Star Trek Judgment Rights if you like more puzzles. Otherwise, um, the Star Trek Voyager Elite Force is pretty cool. That's a first-person shooter. Um, so you get to fight the Borg. And there's even a mode where you can explore the uh, Voyager if you want, where there's nobody to shoot. Huh. So that, that, that's kind of fun. I mean, the, I think is what is it? it's like the Quake 3 engine. So... The graphics are, are fine for the time, but it has all the actors from the show. Um, That's the wrong draw, I think. Yeah, I, exactly. Um, in fact, when, when this Elite Force originally came out, it wasn't the the real actress doing Seven of Nine, and they later had to patch in her re-recording all the lines. But it's, um... <laughs> it's just thinking. When I think Star Trek, first-person shooter is not... <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, it's like they go for whatever was popular at the time, and this is you off the Quake Three engine. You had you know Unreal Tournament and Quake, and all you know first person shooter was the the name of the game. So, you know, just to get back to the early stuff in the book. Yep. Let me see if I can back here. <laughs> can I get back? <laughs> uh, but it's all yeah. There we go. Oh, cancel. It always kind of interested me. Uh, because I've had so many people here on the show, on my show, you know, with the oops, and I'll ask them, you know, some of these people were there at the very earliest days of the computer industry, computer games industry, and we'll talk about like what was your first game that you ever played, what was your first computer game, and and I've had a lot say that it was one of these uh, unauthorized Star Trek, <laughs> you know, DOS or games or maybe even something earlier on a, on a mainframe, but you cover this. I'm pretty sure it was something like what this game is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, Super uh, Star uh, Trek. There's a lot of different versions of it. I cover this version and then there's one version with graphics, but yeah, and it's a little bit like battleship, but more complicated and all text-based, but you can go to different quadrants of the galaxy and you're ultimately, um, if you scroll down to that photo that was just there, that says your mission briefing. I mean, right? You're just trying to destroy the 21 Klingon warships and you have a 33 day uh, time limit. And there's no idea where they are. You have to find them yourself. So you're kind of hunting in the dark, but you can do scans. And when you, you scan for things, it just looks like an asterisk pretty much or 
you know, a K for the, the Klingon warship or whatever letter it is, that part I don't remember. But it's fairly sophisticated for, for being text. And, you know, I was expecting something sort of simple. And uh, instead, I came away pretty um, impressed with it. I mean, did I find it fun? Not exactly, but I like that it's, it's that fun. it was trying to do all of that, you know, back well, when... This was like the only game you had, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Out, like, would this have been... How mind-blowing would this have been? Right. And I mean, there's even versions of this game in some of those cheap, you know, 100 Q Basic games or whatever, right? You remember those books where they just had source code and you'd have to type it in yourself? <laughs> yes. I remember that. Nobody else seems to have ever had that experience. I've never met somebody in person that was like, yeah, well, I shouldn't say that. The tricky yeah, thing with to... those books is they'd I have typos. You know, they would see a book. Yeah. Well, this must be about games or this must be like board games. <laughs> like, you type these things in. <laughs> this is the code. <laughs> right. And I would check those out from the library and sometimes read them just to read the source code and kind of reverse engineer how they were doing things. And oh, it sure. was... Uh... Keep yourself unlimited uh, ships and lives. Well, and... Oh, that too. Yeah, you can cheat with the, the games with if you have the source code, right? But the other part of it is... Changing it to curse words? Well, yes, you can, of course. <laughs> yeah, chain, adding a lot of curse words in there. Yeah, that was a big one. Uh, but looking at the the source code, they would have typos sometimes, so you'd have to debug it when you're not when the the book advertises. You know, type in the code and you get a hundred you know games you can play. So it's um, yeah, there's some some of the source code you could do that with, but you know, some of the ones I remember for the Commodore sixty four, there'd be all these pokes and peaks and just a bunch of numbers. <laughs> so oh, gee, I guess wow. you got a number. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But as long mm -hmm. as it's like go to something or go, remember, go sub. <laughs> yes, go sub. <laughs> go sub, go yeah. sub. Input a dollar sign. God, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Given the vast history of Star Trek video games that followed, it'd be an insult. <laughs> <laughs> That's very strong. <laughs> so really, yes. if you want cred, you've got to play Super Star Trek. Absolutely, yeah. And it's um, it's easy to find. There's also versions you can just play in a browser, which is probably the easiest way to do it and if you go down a little bit it might be the next game no it's not this this was a um this one's got two player options for... it's got two player it's an action game this i played the atari 2600 version wow um but this is again something fairly sophisticated so if you look in the upper right that's the enterprise is that green thing Right, and yeah. and as you're moving, you can see where you are. It's like looking at the um, in Wing Commander or something, seeing where your ship is in relation to other things. On the bottom is the crosshairs, where stuff is. And then in the upper left, it's like weapons and shields and missiles. Yeah, this looks very sophisticated for the time. And uh, I've never played the arcade version, but the arcade version looked like a, a Star Trek kind of captain's chair. It's supposed to be pretty cool. With them, I'm sure with oh, the vector this, graphics. This RA2600 there? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that looks great. That base actually, no, I take that back. This is the DOS version. It's not. I don't oh. think it's Atari, but still, yeah, it's still pretty for the the time. You know, it's CGA and stuff, and uh, yeah, it looks good. I think pretty pretty good and pretty fast kind of action game. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many so many funny parts of this. Yeah, you said that you're, you're kind of trying to walk a line between being funny, I guess, and on one hand. And... Yeah, I think, you know, I'm not... I mean, this could have been really dry and boring. Exactly, right. Where it's like when you, and even looking for research for this, looking at some old computer game magazines uh, where people have the PDF online and reading the reviews, some of those old reviews are pretty dry, right? It's like, this game uses a joystick. You attack things, they attack back. And that's all their review is. Like, the way people talk about computer games has, has changed a lot. I like movies and I like video games. And I think any... Um, I mean, the whole thing about movies based on video games, or, sorry, video games based on movies, isn't something you see that much anymore. Mm -hmm. If you do, it's a Call of Duty skin or something for Fortnite. But it used to be, you know, back when the new Batman came out, There'd be six video games of it for all these different systems. Yeah. If you look at like those Nintendo, like get a big list of Nintendo games, every movie, even like Beethoven. <laughs> yes. Uh, Home Improvement had a video game. <laughs> no matter how, I mean, it's freaking uh, 
Weekend of Bernie's probably has a game. Uh, probably so, yeah. <laughs> there, there was a Porky's game on the 2600. I really? played that. Yes, it's um bizarre, but... Was it R-rated or just a... No, but you... I mean, there is this, a, a level set in the, the shower, and there's a level where you're trying to explode the, the bar at the end. I mean, it follows the plot of the movie, sort of, but it's just as a kind of Pac-Man knockoff. It's very... <laughs> I just remember. I always heard about that movie, and I was, we were never, of course, allowed to watch it. I just imagined that it was this super dirty you know, thing, and when I finally got to see it, I'm like, really? This is what all the fuss is about, right? Yeah, it's not all it's uh, crapped up to be. Well, let's see. You've probably been watching Star Trek forever, right? Do you remember? Was yeah, something yeah like right. That's it? interesting. I mean, so. The first Star Trek I watched, I lived in Argentina at the time. My dad w worked with the government. And to rent videos, we had to go to the embassy. So, I mean, it was whatever they, they had. And they had Star Trek for The Voyage Home, and that was my first one. And in retrospect, that was a really bad one to be your first Star Trek because it's a fish out of water, and you don't know who the <laughs> characters are. <laughs> you can't help yourself, can you, man? <laughs> right. <laughs> so... It's um you know the one with the whales and then I, I didn't really movie. I liked it too yeah no it's a good movie but um I think at the time I was sort of I liked it more because my dad liked it but we didn't get TV channels and stuff over there and you couldn't I guess Star Trek they might have had on videotape but it was like one episode per video or something that they sold for thirty bucks so I think that down the line uh, I guess when the DVDs and stuff started coming out is when I started getting into the show more. Um, and I, I was really more of a Star Trek movie guy first before the TV show. But of course, as a, as a result of writing this book, and my wife is a bigger Star Trek fan. There it is. Yep, there's the poster for Star Trek The Voyage Home. I think it's by is it Bob Peak, something like that. Uh, let's see. Who's it by? I don't know who did that. Yeah, Bob Peak. That's it. It says right there below the picture. Oh, yeah. Oh, the poster. Oh. There's a poster. But, um, that's trivia if you know the artist of the posters <laughs> yes that's true yep indeed um this is definitely one of the most the most fun ones i think so and um no, man, I yeah, so... part of the, the the book you talked about this <clears throat> the the sort of famous triangle of spock and mccoy and, and kirk and this it just so, they're so perfectly balanced <laughs> and it leads to so many great scripts and, and games or maybe the games didn't leverage that, or at least the ones that weren't very good didn't leverage that dynamic as, as well as others. Which game do you think really nails it? Do you, is there one that really gets that right? The the interplay between those three characters? Exactly. Mm. I would say, I mean, we've mentioned this game a lot on here already, but I would say Star Trek Judgment Rights because they do a lot of the banter between the, the characters as you're going around. And also, if you like Leonard Nimoy as Spock, when you're on the bridge, he runs the computer. So he has an encyclopedia and you can hear Leonard Nimoy just read every single damn definition of all the stuff in the game, which is um, can be sort of fun in its own way. I, you know, you get a little bit of it with, I'm looking over the titles here, with the Star Trek Starfleet Academy, which was a, a full motion video game that had um, William Shatner, so Kirk, Walter Koenig, Chekhov, and um, George Takei, Sulu. And there was even sub scenes with all of them together and they filmed them in the real uniforms and everything. So that one, you get some of the the novelty of the full motion video. What? 1997 for that one? 97, yep, yep. So. Originally, this was a Super Nintendo game that didn't have video and was a lot simpler. And they made a when after the Wing Commander stuff, you know, did pretty good. They they were kind of doing their version of it with full motion video. Um, now, because it's at the academy, you don't play as like Kirk or any of those guys, but they're there doing mission briefings and they'll yell at you if you do bad. Um, <laughs> this one's available on GOG. I think the controls on this are, are quite difficult and the mission briefings are like really strict if you get slightly off path you might you know crash into a sun and explode like it, it's less arcadey than wing commander despite trying to do the same look of it but i think the uh the video clips of it i think were the most fun part of it for me 
Um, yeah, you say that it's a joy to see such veteran actors loosen up a bit in their iconic roles on screen, albeit, albeit in computer game form. And this is, I, I think that, you know, we talked before this about like the audience for this book. It could be people that just really love Star Trek. Maybe they're not mm -hmm. really into the games, but they're curious. <laughs> Uh, but there's lots of stuff like this. If you really, again, if you really want to see all of the footage out there. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Can... I'm sure you can look on YouTube if you just want to see the footage and, and watch it. It's um... Well, that's not as much fun. No, no. It's never as fun as doing the real game. But there are some with, I think, that game and Clean that. On. Right. But with um, with Clean On Academy and some of those, uh, there's some YouTube clips of people did 4K AI upscaling of the footage. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Um Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah so Khan Academy, I wanted to talk about this one. I think we I, I think I might have cut you off while you're <laughs> you're talking about your uh oh. how you got into Star Trek. So so you saw Star Trek for Oh saw... right, yeah. So and then after that we would kind of rent the movies every so often, but I didn't see the TV oh. shows until the DVD sets came out. And um I'd watched the the original series episodes with my dad some and that was because that was the one he was familiar with. And then later on my own I'd watch the other ones. It really wasn't until I got married that I watched a lot of the show because my wife is super, super into Star Trek and she would you know, she grew up during Voyager and uh, Deep Space Nine and Next Generation. Um she's a little bit younger than me, so she would watch all, every episode of all of that with her her dad and, and mom and it was a big kind of family bonding thing. That's so cool. we've kind of binged those series over the past several years. We're almost done with Voyager, but we did Next Generation and DS9. Uh, and then I've seen, we're caught up on the new ones um, pretty much, except for Prodigy, which is the, the cartoon that's kind of aimed more at uh, little kids for the most you part. watched the animated series? Yeah, I've watched the original animated series, which they used a lot of it. Pretty good. I liked it. Yeah, no, it, they used a lot of the original writers from the TV show, DC Fontana, stuff like that. And uh, nice. yeah. And, and then there. And, you know, of course, the special effects budget was way more reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, they could do what they wanted. And um, weirdly, everyone in that cartoon did their voice except for um, Walter Koenig as Chekhov. They had someone else voice him. What was up with that? Oh, it's been a while since I've read about that. I think it might have been a money thing. But it was just because originally it was going to have just, um, you know, just the three Kirk, Spock and McCoy doing their own voices. And then they were going to have sound alikes for the rest. But then Leonard Nimoy, I believe, stepped up and said, no, you have to use the people, the real actors. They need, you know, we want them to use the real guy. It won't seem the same. And I don't know why Chekhov didn't or, or Walter Koenig didn't do, do Chekhov. But he did write an episode of the cartoon, which must have been weird to write an episode for a cartoon that features your character that you don't do the voice of. Yeah, there it is. And and you had like the cat alien, I think from uh, what, Larry Niven might've written an episode actually, come to think of it. Um, oh, the manzine, or what was that? Yeah, yeah, yep. A series that he did. He did yeah, tons this, of those. This guy it, here. <laughs> it's like a... Uh... But I thought, you know, I just thought the animation was a good medium for Star Trek. Cause again, you don't, yeah. you're not by the constraints of the human body. Well, and on the newer shows, there's so much of the special effects that they might as well be animated anyway. Yeah, go on. With 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 all the green screen stuff, it's like I don't. You don't always get great performances with people reacting to green screen. I always prefer. I mean, the computer graphics look very realistic now. It looks a lot better than say, you know, I don't know, the Frighteners or maybe the first Tron or I mean, which I like Tron, but um, stuff looks more realistic. But I think it's still doesn't look as good as like a puppet wiggling around yeah I was, i've just been coincidentally we've been watching some of those old ray harry harry Housen, i believe is his name oh fun yep and the sinbads and mm -hmm. argonauts jason and the argonauts and they got a couple of the doctor who's or actors from doctor who <laughs> like tom baker's got a movie and then i think patrick trotton's got one and what i noticed about that is for one i think the <clears throat> The little models, the claymation, whatever you want to call it, is really good. Yeah, <laughs> it holds up super. I mean, a lot of times I'm like, that's actually looks more realistic uh, than especially some of the early CGI. But you know, even today, you know, it holds its own. And plus, it's just an art form in its own right. Uh, but I noticed that, 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 like somebody like Tom Baker, who I, I assume he had done his Doctor Who run, 
before that movie. I could be wrong about that. But I feel like he was more comfortable with the green screen. <laughs> yeah, he seemed a little more convincing interacting with the models and things than some of the other actors. And I wondered if it was just because he had been on that show for so long and it's just probably second day for him, <laughs> you know, to have a green screen. Right. It, yeah, it, it might be. I don't know. And I think, um, I mean, Doctor Who, that's a show that intimidates me. I'd watch some of it in college, but there's so many episodes of that and so many different doctors. Oh, I like I get... Tom Baker's my favorite, but you Tom know, Baker, yeah. it's not like James Bond, you know, everybody. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could ever beat Sean Connery. And I'm like, Roger Moore. <laughs> right. Can you talk a little bit about Doctor Who games? I, I seem like that comes up somewhere in the book. Um, I make some Doctor Who references, I think. Yeah. But if, let's see, I'm looking at the table of contents here. That'd be even harder to make games about. I don't. I remember playing a few Doctor Who games, but nothing really stands they've, out. They've done some web games, but yeah, I'm not as familiar with those. Let's see. If you go, can you go to 147? Oh, Just man. about have to be a uh, adventure game. I think so. Yeah, if you did Doctor Who, that would be the 147. Best. Yeah. Okay. Let me do it. So, so this one here. In fact, the book was delayed a bit because I wanted to include this. This was the new Star Trek game oh, that got is, delayed yeah. a right. little bit. This is Star Trek Resurgence. Of course, after I finished my proof to the publisher, they announced yet another Star Trek game, but by then it was too late to, to add something, but you wanted to see him. We got to wait another year. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, and I interviewed uh, the, the lead writer, uh, Dan Martin, on on this one. But yeah, this is this one I would say is kind of like a throwback to the um judgment rights and some of those more adventure game things and you it, it, the story kind of goes between it, it the people that made this they used to work at telltale games that did the walking dead and some of those ones and uh Excellent. so so it has you know all that branching stuff which is cool in the storylines you kind of go back and forth between playing an engineer and playing someone that um i forget if they're a captain or it's been a bit since i played the game but so it they have some arcade sequences, but they're not too annoying, and it, you get to see kind of like the upper decks and the lower decks, kind of the class system, as it were, on the ship. And uh, Spock is a character in there. They have a good Spock sound to like. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, and Riker is, is there as well. So it's set during uh, Next Generation kind of time period. And um, it's... So you really like it. Yeah, I, I did. I think, you know, it was a good kind of return to form because there hadn't been other than phone games there hadn't been kind of a bigger star trek game in a while so this was uh pretty cool and the, to to see it as you know instead of chapters it's broken up into episodes which is cute which have the star trek next generation font <laughs> um and uh yeah i just think they do a good uh good job with it so but that one they um if it's not on Steam, it should be on Steam soon. They also released it on consoles and, and stuff. So, Oh, yeah. It was, it was originally just on the Epic Mega Game Store, but I, I think that might be no longer the case. At its core, Star Trek is always about story. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was this, <clears throat> the 25th anniversary where they're basically telling a story set later. Then the series, or am I getting that mixed up with another? No, game? no, I think you're right. It's set after the um, show, and in the interview with Michael Stackpole, he said, especially in the first game, he wanted to have more stuff kind of intersect with episodes of the show, but Paramount wouldn't let him. Uh, so I think if you go to the, it's there. It is. It's that last paragraph on this. Uh, question here on that first game oh, yeah i, I would have had that experience i've read some star trek novels and you're like yeah the novel's great i loved it but it doesn't feel good thinking this this has no continuity right this is not it's not going to be acknowledged by the main you know it's not going to show up in any of the shows or movies or not, never going to make a reference to it i don't know why do they do it doesn't make sense to me he I just, even, I, I don't think this is in the book, but he did, when I interviewed him, he told me, I, I asked him, well, did you um, ever want to write a Star Trek book? Because he wrote all those Star Wars books. And he said, yeah. And I um, kind of pitched it to, uh, you know, whoever their 
Star Trek's editor was at the time for the books. And again, it was something that was sort of similar to a, that kind of worked in the crevices of an episode or a movie or something. And they said, oh, we don't want that. We want it to be kind of a standalone thing. Um, and he said, yeah, I don't want to do that. How do you do that? I, I don't want to do that. So there it is. Okay. Yeah. And, and then he mentions with Star Wars, they are a lot more flexible. Getting in there. So let's see. What are they not? They weren't working with a continuity. Yeah. So they just wanted these little one-off books that wouldn't really make an impact on anything. Right. I guess they figured people, but then I don't know if you're a Star Trek and you're oh, into it enough it. to read a book, you think you would want that continuity. You think you'd want all that, um, you know, lore or whatever you call it. It's, but yeah, I think it's really, I don't get it at all. You know, that this all this talk about what's canon, what's not canon, and all that sort of stuff. But I just think if somebody really loves Star Trek and they, they want to invest the time to learn like everything there is to know, I mean, you'd want to focus on things that matter. Yes. <laughs> you think, well, why, why am I going to read all these comics and or whatever if it's, none of this stuff is canon? I don't know. I guess a different way to say that was, well, if you like Star Trek enough, you wouldn't care. <laughs> Just... Right. And, um, oh, gee, I forget the name of it, but there was one, they would tend to do the Star Trek books later on when they sold well in like series. And there's one where it was kind of like each book was from a different series, but it kind of had a, a central bad guy that kind of traveled through time or something. Oh, but, yeah. each, but each book, um, the first five books, I think were paperback. But each one, you know, it, it wasn't quite the full book. And to get the ending of each book, you had to buy a hardcover. <laughs> Isn't that, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. The hardcover just had like the last two chapters of like five books or whatever. And um, that got a pretty negative fan reaction. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking of reading this, the Matrix movies and how they did their comics and games where it was all kind of connected. Yeah. They, they've gotten better with that. They have um, people that work full time as continuity people. Yeah, that's important for some of these big ones. It is. These things have a history, and you know, to some people it might be a silly TV show. To other people, it might mean a lot more. So, it, um, I, my wife and I have gone on a few of these Star Trek cruises, where there's actor. Not too long ago. Yeah, we just got back from Star Trek cruise awesome. eight, I think. No, it was seven. But anyhow, yeah. So they have actors from the shows and uh, you can get photos and signatures and they do, um, you know, shows on the ship. And sometimes it's almost more like a talent show, like they'll sing opera and stuff. It's kind of bizarre. But yeah, just to see how much it means to people that uh, is is pretty interesting. And it was kind of an inspiration to, uh, oh, that's to, what to do the book, to be honest, in a way. Yeah. So this was... 2025 is the next one and it usually um but if you want you can pay a few hundred bucks and they have people that used to work in the star trek show and they'll do the the ferengi makeup on you or the clean on makeup so it's um what is the what are the other passengers like is are they fun to hang out with or is there kind of a... I, I think so yeah i mean you get to when they seat you for dinner on the ship they kind of put you on tables with other people to save um to make the most of their space and they all seem very nice they're not as rude as uh, some regular people on cruises are um, <laughs> i've never been on a cruise is that, is that common rude it it can be i think sometimes people get, get rich and or sometimes it's a lot of very wealthy people in the cruise that kind of want everything immediately and and aren't na nice to the staff but no i think everyone oh. i i met on the star trek cruise was was nice and uh sometimes you'll see the actors hanging around the bar and they'll let you talk to them and stuff it all depends on on what what they're comfortable with. Some of the people just stay in their room. But yeah, to get in an elevator and look over and there's uh, Brent Spiner, the guy that played Data is next to you is kind of is kind of fun. I mean, that's that, part that of sort of thing happens, right? It's not. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I don't know being in an elevator with Brent Spiner. <laughs> you know, I never, I never know what to say to celebrities like that. I mean, yeah, with be like the ten thousandth millionth person that's been like, oh, you're so great as Data, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, we had him, um, I think on last year's cruise, we had him sign a picture that we had taken with him at a different convention. 
and he was pretty willing to talk for a second. So I, you know, we talked about conventions in Portland, Oregon, which is where I live. And he yeah. said, I went to the hotel and I had a steak. And I'm like, I have to ask him something. And I said, was the steak good? And Brent Spiner paused and turned his head just like Data does on the show. Oh, my I'm God. like, it was worth asking that dumb question for that. <laughs> he was like, yes, yes, it was. But yeah, he was... Um, but no, I think it. I think it's a good experience. It's more expensive than a regular cruise, and I'm trying to talk on one about this this book actually. So we'll see if that happens. Oh, hopefully, maybe you can do a book about Star Trek cruises at some point. Maybe, maybe, yeah. I thought about that too, and then my wife is like, "Can you enjoy the vacation and not make everything into a book?" Ask, are there other? <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's Star Trek cruises, but are there? Yes. Other... Other kinds of franchise based cruises? Oh, th there's a lot. I was really surprised. Um, there's one on the show Supernatural. Uh, there's a, a Kiss themed cruise I just learned about today. The uh, John St. John, the guy who does the voice of Duke Nukem, has his own cruise. That one I really was amazed at. But I think if you can get enough of a fan base. What, and, just and... Duke Nukem fans? Cruise? Yes. Yes. That I is specialized. Right. And. Um, I mean the you know the Duke Nukem games are great. It's been a while since the, there's been one, but yeah, so they they have a lot of these for different uh, franchises, and it's sort of like if a comic book convention on a boat is how I describe it. Whether it's worth the price, that's sort of up to you. But I, I I've had fun with that. In fact, I talked about people on the cruise about this Star Trek video game book we're talking about, and seeing if people seemed interested, and a lot of people did, which was nice. And everyone's like, oh, did you include this game? Did you include this game? And it's like, well, I can't include everything, but the um the ones people get excited about is uh is kind of all over the place because there there were so many of these different games and, and like we've said star trek has been around for decades so even if you think a game might be bad it's, i think it's always someone's favorite at the end hmm. and one of the questions is what game surprised you the most yeah um i would say Star Trek Klingon Academy, I was really impressed with. That was one of oh, them. Is that the one that has the Klingon Learning Institute or the Yes, yeah, it has a Klingon language lab or something like that. Yeah, it has Klingon Language Lab as part of the stuff in there. there or, or no, actually, no, that one's Star Trek Klingon, excuse me. But Oh, which um, one I'm confused now. What? <laughs> that Star which Trek has... Klingon has the language lab. Okay, so what is that language lab? What is it? It is like a a slimmed down version of Rosetta Stone or one of those language programs where you, you pick words oh, and it, it, it reads it out loud in Klingon and then it has, um, you can speak into the microphone and listen to how your pronunciation stacks up against the Klingon. But the, the main game is a full motion video um, interactive movie thing where if you make the wrong choice, you die and it's like a holodeck simulation. It's kind of a murder mystery. Um, the game itself wasn't one of my favorites, but the language lab, I thought that's really clever. They were trying to think of other things to fatten up the package. And um, they could almost just market this language lab as its own product. I feel. I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I remember in the bookstore, I don't know if it's still in print, but they had a version of Hamlet you could buy in English and in Klingon. Yeah, it's originally in Klingon. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, with the Star Trek <laughs> Six joke. Um, we talked another... about that, not in this interview, but I've, yeah, you know, that the it's really famous. The Klingon dictionary and the yeah, the uh, creator of that, Lincoln on his name. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the name, but another uh, game Mark that's Austin or no, 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 Austin. Let's see. Oh, come on. Another game in here that surprised me was the um, start was a. Uh, trek no it's not trek trivia what is it it's the star trek Mark um quiz one what mark Cochran. mark Cochran's the guy that's right star trek the game show that's what i'm thinking of on page 66 that's one i thought w was really fun they so it's their star trek trying to do like you don't know jack so yeah. right and but they have john delancey who plays q is the host and he just nails it being really a, a smart ass and condescending Perfect. With the, with the narration. I mean, this is why don't they have a version of this on the iPhone is what I'm wondering. Like, that would be the perfect thing you could put. Uh, or even as a an app or a browser game or something, because you can pick if you're a Vulcan, which is kind of silly, but it's... Um, I'm sure he'd be willing to do some more. I bet he would, yeah, because he, he does a lot of voiceover work and um, 
Who do they have as the? I don't think I think she's an actress that has done some work. She's another Q, but they made her up for the game, and she's you know the Vanna White. Yeah. Um, if you get questions wrong, it does this mystery science theater thing where a nerd voice starts screaming at you. That's really annoying. <laughs> where he says, no, no, the answer is supposed to be this. And um, the character is even called know-it-all. So it, I think they thought it's the kind of thing that's cute maybe once, but if um, you hear it a lot, it kind of grates on you. But it's, uh... but no, I think this was a fun game and Star Trek trivia has been around for a lot. You know, we looked at the old text trivia game, but this one, the, the added component of uh, Q and stuff, I think it, it's a good match of the license. There you go again. Classic Shergi. Yes. You don't have me to pronounce that, though. I don't know how to pronounce it. But yeah, I was using... Um, Straight from the... Is that Klingon? Might be. I'm not sure. I, I had to use... Um, oh, what was it? Sangragni. I was I was looking at Star Trek dictionaries and things online, and just the, the number of aliens they have on the show and, and languages and things. It's just astounding. Huh. Late in his career, nine years before his death, Galactic Ladies Man Jim Kirk almost married a very special woman. In the Nexus, he tells Captain Picard about this woman. What is her name? Is that your answer, Carol? That's my answer. I don't think that's the right answer. I think it might be Antonia, but watch me get that wrong. But it's wow, there's a lot of options. There is, yeah. I mean, the and you just play with the keyboard, and you can play with more than one person on the same keyboard, kind of pass and play. It's um, the animations are you know zippy when the stuff is spinning around. It's just a well done package. It's it's something I, you know, if Gog was going to re-release something, I think this one would do pretty well. Uh, I think it, I think you're right about it being a just a natural choice for a phone mobile game. Yeah. Um... Or like a Netflix, you know, Netflix is... Oh, oh, that's that's a good idea, right? Because Netflix is doing some games on there. Yeah, and you on, already got the, the Star Trek platform. people there watching all the... That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Even Biley better for them. Yep. It'd be a home run for sure. All right, give me a... You could give me a more appropriate pun. <laughs> oh. <No. laughs> have to look it up now. So many, so many things out there. It's... um. Well, how about this? I have a... Here's a Star Trek joke I heard, and it's one of the, the worst like dad jokes ever but it's how many ears does spock have two how many ears does spock have <laughs> two two oh no it's three a left ear a right ear and a final front ear <laughs> <laughs> yeah feels good yep but yeah, there's you know a lot of Star Trek games out there, and hopefully the book gets more people to to play them, and they'll they'll learn something. Um, the interviews, looking back on it, maybe I should have done more. It was something I wanted to add because if it just was a book of my impressions of these games, I felt like it wasn't enough in there, and you wanted. And I always like kind of making up sort of material. Um, and I like that some of the stuff I included was from just people's memories of playing the games. Yeah. If if you go to Star Trek Online, I talked to Kat Bailey, who's a, a journalist, a gaming journalist, and she talks about really being into Star Trek Online. And then I also talked to uh, uh, a podcaster who wasn't good at video games at all, and he talks about how difficult of a problem he had with Star Trek Online. So I think getting those perspectives was good I was as always well. curious about Star Trek Online. I never jumped on the bandwagon. But you say it's good, really. I guess it's still around, right? It's still around. I mean, it, it's a bit long in the tooth. It came out uh, around the a little bit after Lord of the Rings Online. So it, that it's still around at all it is a bit surprising. But they've redone the graphics and done stuff to keep it up to date, change the starting area. Um, and you can play most of it for, for free. I think if you want to, to play as a Borg or something, you have to pay money or if you want, you know, some better gear. But... Until your level character reaches 65, yeah. I mean, so that, that that's a, a lot of gameplay right there. Um, the controls on the spaceships aren't very good, but... Huh. Imagine you'd probably play something like this just to meet other people, right? Other. I would think so, yeah. When I talked to um, Kat Bailey, she mentioned... So yeah, this first one is Clinton Alvord of uh, The Topic is Trek. 
and he's you know not much of a video game guy but he he tried it out for his podcast i guess and he just talks about it it's funny to get that perspective from someone that never plays mmos what it's like to play one because there's a lot you take for granted and boss bosworth carmichael <laughs> uh. and yeah he called his ship the uss literally <laughs> That's... Yeah, that thing. You know, why don't they ever do something with the? I see what he's saying here. Like he expected to take classes. I mean, basically, be part of the academy. Yeah, and it's... instead, it's sort of the standard. Kind of you know, jump. shoot the, shoot the targets and give the guy twenty apples or whatever. Like it. I think that's what a lot of people miss. Maybe some of the games too. Is that you know you think about how different Star Trek is from just about every other, you know, show out there, science fiction or not. Yeah, the games ought to be just as unique as that in terms of game. Like the the Star, Star Trek game shouldn't be like just a Doom game with you know a different. Right, right. No, that, that's that's a good point, and and you can tell with some of these they just slap a license on something and they're trying to chase a trend. Um, some and, of the things just took the obvious route, like the or this is taking place in the holodeck, you know. And it's, it's yeah, plus that game is like a simulation of a simulation of a simulation. <laughs> like, right, right. How meta is that? That's too funny. I remember uh, you really liked the Game Boy one too. Yeah, yeah, that that's a good one to end on here. It's um, what was the name? Do you remember the name of that one? I think it's just called Star Trek: The Next Generation. Next. Uh, I misspell something. Oh, it's gonna. If I just look. Yeah, the way you've got this divided up, in case you didn't notice, folks, is uh, by show. And then there's yeah, movies, and then I there's... considered doing it, you know, chronologically at first. Which, but if if you scroll up, it gets to to generation stuff. Keep generations going. is this? Or, the... No, no, no. So that's the movie. But if you scroll up to the page before um okay i guess it's that the star trek game boy so 51 um yeah i originally was gonna oh, have it. Right. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's you know a pretty impressive rendering of the enterprise on the old game boy which definitely uh, that is yeah, awesome the pixel artwork and it's it's a you go in missions but it's like a collection of mini games you know because you're either beaming people up or or fighting ships and and whatever and it's presented as a kind of Starfleet Academy thing where you're doing these training missions, but that it can do graphics like that. I think are pretty impressive and it it's bite-sized games. The missions are pretty short. It was designed with the portable system in mind. Um, you get to switch, talk to the different crew members to have them, you know, repair the engines or, or whatever. This is weird, Matt, because with this one, you 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 really seem like you hate it. Like this is annoying. This is not that much fun. You know. Yes. Yeah, and it's you're a, like, it, you should. Everybody should get this game. <laughs> yeah, I, my opinion changed as I was writing it because uh, but, it's like I think it's like the whole is better, or the sum of the parts is, is better than the stuff individually. And it's like once you get the hang of it and you're kind of jumping between the different systems, it's fun. And. um but yeah, some of these games were not good and some of these were not fun to play. But I, if you just have all the good games, I mean, who wants that? And it's also someone's opinion if it's good or not. Like, I you might know, like it, you might hate it. Phenomenon where it seems like you hate a game sometimes, you know, you just keep focusing on like the negatives, but then you realize you played it for 100 hours. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. It's like, there's got to be, you know, even though you've got this negative sort of cloud around you, you know, it's, it can't be right because... There's something about it that's fun. Right. Um, yeah, we're about time to wrap up here, unfortunately. Yeah, we need to get going. What, but what, what's it, do you have any other last questions that comes to mind? Uh, I feel like we've covered everything. Okay. I guess um, unless you want to talk about any chapters you left out. You yeah, talk yeah, that, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I mean, so... I there is when you work well you know this with the yearbooks but you work with the publisher and you have a length you need to do and yeah. this kept on exceeding the length and i thought well i just want to cut it down to what i i promised which i think it's around 150 pages or something like that so um including the pictures 
And so to get there, I um, one of the ones I took out was a game based on the Star Trek movie, the J.J. Abrams one. It's just called Star Trek. And I even interviewed uh, Kat Bailey, who we, we saw an interview with in there uh, about, uh, about it. She talked about going to the press junket for that and looked really cool there, and then the game kind of sucked. But I didn't include it because I think that game's really awful. <laughs> and I'm like, there's already a good mixture of good and bad games. Like, I can't... I felt like that one was kind of easy enough to leave out. There was uh, an RTS that was just super mediocre Star Trek New Worlds that I think came out in the like 2002 or something like that. And it, it felt like Star Trek meets Command and Conquer. And I mean, you want to talk about them slapping a license on something. It just felt really a poor mix of gameplay to, uh, to, to Star Trek. Star Trek Monopoly, you know, board. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> you, know? you can. <laughs> well, hey, Matt, thanks for taking the time. Really loved your book. I hope people pick it up. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, no, this it's was fun. People, do they need to go to the website to get it? Is Amazon the best way? I mean, how did they? Yeah, um, so right now it's available. It's a UK publisher. So if you go to um, you look up Pen and Sword Books, you can pick it up from there. I'll put the, we'll put the link in the show notes. It's not on Amazon.com yet, but it should be there soon. It's on Amazon.co.uk. Um, but um, yeah, definitely when the, the Amazon.com links come up, I'll update you on it. So there you go. Yep. Yeah, let's see. So it's pen hyphen and hyphen sword.co.uk. Yep, that's the one. You could probably find it just by looking for Matt Bradley, Shergi, Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But Shergi, they'll misspell. But yeah, you can. Uh, uh, but, but White Owl. I, publisher that might help white owl, yeah white owl books and, is, uh, and if you you know you can do that real quick if you click on um or if you just google white owl books and you can see they actually have a whole line of um video game books yeah click that video games link right uh, there and so they have other stuff that hasn't come out yet but it's some of its console some of its computer game they came out with an adventure game book not that long ago you know, ever um, thought of you and me getting together again with the collab? Yeah, we. Oh, that was over twenty years ago, I think. <laughs> but we we were talking about doing what, like a event. It was more academic, like graphic adventure. You had a whole graphic adventure game book. We had a two or three chapters done too, I think. Yeah, and then I'm not. I think I moved, and I don't know what happened. But yeah, I wouldn't mind doing something. But yeah, so well, you can see that this period, like when these books were really hit flying off the shelves, and then it seemed to be a bit of a lag or something. Right, so, just have a lot of books. My God. Yeah, but this uh, the White Owl Books is who I'm doing it through, and they have a lot of different guide to movie based that. video games, nonviolent video games, which is kind of interesting. Um, Do they call bad, bad video games? <laughs> That's Umbra Game Development. Well, how do they have so many books? It's incredible. The the pen and sword books they're owned by a big um, newspaper conglomerate in the UK, and they publish just a lot of stuff every month. But um, so but they, yeah, they they got all kinds of stuff on there. So uh, their video games books is something fairly more recent. I think within the past five years is when they started doing those. But I you know I wasn't fam I was just looking on Amazon to see what video game books were out there and what was selling, and I noticed a lot was from this publisher. So when I pitched them, they liked my. Uh, it initially was a Star Wars book that I pitched, a Star Wars video game book. And they didn't want that. And then I, I pitched them, well, what about Star Trek? And they said, yes. And then uh, my research, that's how the book began. So well, I thought this was like Gothic, the series, but I think it's. No, it's more. Um, uh, like although the... those Gothic games are pretty interesting. They're more open ended, right? I haven't played those in a long time. Oh, there's so, yours. There's mine. So Star Trek video games, an official guide to the final frontier. Now I'm going to be thinking about that spot joke. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> right All there. right. Here. Okay. Well, live long and prosper, Matt. Thank you. Yep. Do the whole thing. You can do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See you later. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Well, now, it's always a, a fun to get to chat with Matt. He's, of course, the uh, assistant producer here on the show he's been getting me all kinds of uh, good interviews and you know i asked him if he could get me an interview with himself and it turns out he was able to do that so <laughs> thank you to uh, to matt for that 
Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Uh, yes, you all you match headers out there, all you patrons and ratrons, thank you so much for keeping this show on the air. Thank you to Will. <laughs> We've got some... Uh, new rat chatters, or I say rat chatters, new mat chat uh, support coming in. So thanks so much for that. Uh, you're keeping these episodes coming, keeping the show alive. Could not and would not do it without you. So if for whatever reason you're remaining on the sidelines, you know, you, know, you want to join mat chat, but you're just not quite there yet. Let's uh, take it to the next level. <laughs> yes. Engage. Uh, go to the uh, that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Couple of minutes, couple of bucks, you're in. You're golden. You got the Discord channel. You feel really cool. You like the show ten times better if you are a supporter of it. I have that on very good authority. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. So thanks. Oh, oh, by the way, I still got some of these uh, coins left. These, are, of course, the official Matt Chat tokens. Yes, Rat Chat currency. Some of the best coins around, probably the best Matt Chat coin you know you could ever own, to be perfectly honest with you. Still got a few of those left, so if you want one, uh, just use your Patreon. You know, while you're over there setting up your Patreon account, uh, just let me know you like one of these coins. You have to put your address. You have to send me the mailing address, but then I'll put the coin in the mail for you. So, there's still a few of those left, so you better act fast, because once they're gone... <laughs> what about that news from the Mac Cave? Oh, a lot of news, lots and lots of news. What have we got? Miko uh, writing in about Sword Haven Iron Conspiracy. Now, I, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this game before, but the Kickstarter is live at this point. There's a demo you can download. Check, check it out. Uh, it looks really good. It's a classic party-based RPG from, uh, I believe it's Atom, A-T-O-M, and the same people that were doing that uh, uh, sort of Fallout-style post-apocalyptic game, which is also quite nice. I hope I have that right. <laughs> uh, correct me, please, if I'm wrong about, about the studio. Uh, anyway, this is a uh, party-based game, and I believe, yes, you can switch between real-time with pause, like the Infinity Engine games, Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, you, you name it. Uh, but you can switch it to a turn-based combat. And it's more like uh, uh, Pillars 2, or of course, uh, I want some of the later games that have offered this function. Uh, anyway, I, I really like it when you can switch between the two. I think it's a really good choice. I know from a design perspective, it must <laughs> be a pain, because <laughs> yeah, you basically have to make two different combat systems and adjust everything twice. Uh, so it's not an insignificant achievement when they're able to do this, you know, where you're able to shift back and forth flawlessly. That's really cool. Uh, let's see. Explore the land of Nova Draconia. Embark on quests unique to the character. Discover artifacts. Unravel a conspiracy. A flexible engine. Classless role-playing system. Yeah, our role-playing system's got no class. Just no class. I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> you know, is this? The, I feel like I've talked about this before. Maybe it was a different game that was doing the same thing with this classless business. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of it. I haven't played too many where this turned out very well, but we'll see. You know, maybe this is the exception. Distinctive dialogues, novel ways to solve quests, vast nonlinear world, multi-solution quests, always offering alternative approaches to satisfy any character build. So they talk a good talk, and they put together a pretty good uh, trailer and demo. So we'll see how it goes. I'm, my hopes are high for this. Looks really good. I pledge to it. Sword Haven Iron Conspiracy. Check it out on Kickstarter. Moving on, Miko, Miko. I just was talking about you, Miko. That's because Miko keeps submitting all this awesome news tidbits over on Discord. And believe this, the stuff I'm covering on this channel, just a portion. you got to get to the Discord to see all the news. Uh, not just from Miko. <laughs> Miko uh, posts a lot of stuff, but we've got Punny, we've got Scarlet over there, who's a uh, tire gaming dad, you'll bet. <laughs> just a bunch of good folks over there. Posting news, discussing, he's really missing out, see? He's not part of the Patreon. Uh, anyway, uh, this is an item about Dragon Age Dread Wolf. Enter the world of Thedos, a vibrant land of rugged wilderness, treacherous labyrinths, and glittering cities. Steeped in savage combat and secret magic. The world teeters on a knife's edge. That must be a really big knife. 
See, full, full reveal summer 2024. And they're promising that in this game, friendship, drama, and romance will abound. Probably three of my least favorite <laughs> things. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I think Bioware does romance better than anybody. Uh, so we'll see. You know, this could be good. Now, uh, Miko does posit a rumor. The rumor, uh, again, as unsubstantiated, thus rumor. Take it for what it's worth. Rumor. <laughs> Mention it's a rumor. <laughs> that EA, Electronic Arts, has lost patience with Bioware and wants the game out this year no matter the stakes. <laughs> or no matter the state that it's in. Uh, so they've reached that point. They're going to rush this thing through the door. Bugs and glitches and incomplete well, whatever. You know, it's got to be It's got to be done. <laughs> so, at least that's the rumor. So, you know, again, you might want to tamper or temper your enthusiasm a little bit uh, if that rumor turns out to be true. But again, we don't know. We will soon enough, though, I guess by the end of the summer. And what do you think about those Dragon Age games? I, I really liked the first one. I know some people didn't think it was the best. Uh, the second one was okay. Uh, I didn't really care for the other one so much. Not that they're bad. I just don't feel any particular reason to go back and replay them. Uh, but I really liked the first one. And I really liked the uh, Mass Effect. Uh, first couple of those games, too. Uh, so always uh, keep an open mind when it comes to Bioware. I'll give it a chance, I'm sure, when it comes out. And we'll see. All right, and then Gizmodo, uh, Cheryl Eddy, uh, writes in about a NASA game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that NASA. <laughs> so I guess uh, the pe people, good people over at NASA, maybe they don't have as much to do anymore with Elon Musk sending up all the rockets. <laughs> you know, what do we do? Well, they sit around designing role-playing games now. Yes, this is one called The Lost Universe. Uh, they say the agency's first ever tabletop role-playing game. A dark mystery has settled over the city of Aldestron on the rogue planet of Exlaris. Researchers dedicated to studying the cosmos have disappeared. Goodbye, <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, I guess. And the Hubble Space Telescope has vanished from Earth's timeline. Only an ambitious crew of adventurers can uncover what was lost. Are you up to the challenge? Well, it's not rocket science, but maybe it is. So, <laughs> check it out. It's free. It's called The Lost Universe. Now, again, a bit of a warning, a disclaimer. Apparently, there is a taint of educational uh, elements to this. It might actually teach you something useful, ostensibly. So you might want to be wary of that. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, anyway, I thought that was pretty fun. You know, NASA designing a role-playing game. I'll give it a shot. All right, what about that ale of the week? Yes, the ale of the week. Well, you know, I've been a, a recent convert to this athletic brewing company. And I, I, in my opinion, the best so I've tried of non-alcoholic uh, brews, just really solid. You know, it's, these have been good enough where uh, I think even if you, you maybe you uh, don't care about non-alcoholic or alcoholic or whatever, you're just looking for something tasty, I think these would be solid choices. Uh, but, you know, if you do, uh, if you are looking for a non-alcoholic brew that tastes like the real thing, I don't see how you get much better than these <coughs> athletics. <coughs> so this one is uh, called the Wits Peak. It's a Belgian-style white. And so I assume what they're going for here is uh, something like a Blue Moon. Um, there's a couple other, <laughs> other ones. Uh, I'm blanking on some of the names. I used to like one called Hitashino. I think it was a Japanese white ale. Uh, very solid if you ever come across that. It's got a little uh, owl, owl on it. <laughs> I need to get this open. My throat is dry. Uh, so anyway, I don't think there's too much to say about it here. They say uh, cues of citrus, coriander, you know, again, fits in quite well with that uh, any good wheat ale. A lot of them will have uh, coriander as a seasoning or a spice. Uh, Belgian style, refreshingly bright, soft, and smooth. Nowhere. You know, I think there's a brewery in Canada, a Canadian brewery that does some really good uh, Belgian style wheats. I wish I could remember the name of that one, too, but they're a good, solid choice. And, of course, you got the, uh, uh, was it the triple, the Belgian, all the Belgian Abiels that are quite solid. But <laughs> I, I don't think this is going to be as good as those, but we'll see. You know, if it's as good as a Blue Moon, that's, that's not a small achievement. All right, I like Blue Moon. It's a good, uh, a good brew if you're looking for something light and refreshing. Uh, anyway, I guess I'll go ahead and open this and pour it into the glass. You know, one thing I have noticed about these NAs is sometimes 
they're even more likely to just foam up and bubble out and just go crazy. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> I've had a lot of them, though. I'm, I've gotten to the point where I open these over a sink. And just because I've had so many kind of just, you know, blue shout. Uh, this time I got lucky, I suppose. Okay, pouring her in. Uh, smells good. Very citrusy. Uh, you can smell the hops. A little hoppier, I think, than a, uh, a blue moon. You know, when I smell a blue moon, it smells uh, the citrus just kind of overpowers everything. But uh, this one, you can tell the uh, a little hops. I'd almost say it's a little bit skunky. Uh, which is strange considering it's in a can. Uh, I don't know, possibly they let this out too, too long in the sun or something, but just a faint, faint trace. And again, I don't know if that's, you know, I could go get another six pack. It might not have that at all. So uh, I'm not going to uh, judge it based on that. Anyway, smells really solid, kind of peachy, citrusy, like they say. Really good aroma on this. I'll try some in the glass and try the horn. Yeah, <laughs> damn, man. Mm. Holy cow. <laughs> I am just amazed at how good of a job these, these guys are doing. You know, I think this is better than a blue moon. Just, you know, they've totally nailed that sort of a uh, lighter Belgian flavor, the Belgian wheat style. <clears throat> Here, I'll <clears throat> give some in the, uh, into the horn, just because we don't want this horn to get lonely. The horn gets thirsty. Yeah, pour a little bit in there. Full spectrum. Mm. Oh, just a magnificent flavor on this. Very uh, great body. <clears throat> it's very active, a lot of bubbles. Try one more swig here. Mm. You know what? Make it two swigs. That's the nice thing about a, a non-alcoholic brew. You <laughs> drink as much as you like. <laughs> oh, wow. This is just so good. Uh, this might be my favorite. Uh, now, it is kind of a distinctive style. Uh, not ever, not everybody's going to like a, a Belgian style. I really love it. Probably my favorite. Um, so, you know, you know your tastes if you don't like it. Put it this way. I know some of you folks don't drink beer. Maybe you've only tried the hoppy like IPAs or uh, the Pilsners and you'd say, well, I don't like beer. <laughs> you might want to try one of these Belgian styles because uh, they're very different. It's, it's To me, it's just like a completely different beverage uh, than those other options. So you, you never know. You might like this. And it's non-alcoholic, so you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, really solid choice. I'm just... <laughs> what can I say? I'd say out of the... Uh, if we, again, if we just compare it to other non-alcoholics, I gotta go five out of five. Just super solid choice. No regrets. There's no wateriness. There's no... Oh, you know, it's not bad for a, a non-alcoholic. None of that. Just a good solid choice. If we're going to compare it to like, okay, Abbey Ales and uh, Ales from Belgium, you know, then of course you have to knock it, knock it back a few points because those are basically God's gift to earth. <laughs> you know, I might uh, say uh, maybe somewhere between a three and a four if we're going to compare it that way, but just in that realm of NAs though, no, no brainer. <laughs> get, get a couple six packs of this. Uh, I think you'll really like it, especially if you're looking for something in that Belgian style, haven't been able to find it in a non-alcoholic format. All right, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And uh, I asked Matt Bradley Shurgy, what was his favorite Star Trek uh, quotation? And he gave me one, of course, from the great Gene Roddenberry. It goes something like this. Star Trek says that it has not all happened. It has not all been discovered that tomorrow can be as challenging and adventurous as any time man has ever lived. Lovely sentiment there. So ponder on that and I'll see you guys next time.
Where are we going? Where they went. Suppose they went nowhere. Then this will be your big chance to get away from it all. 